morning and happy Sabbath. How's everybody doing today? You're here, so that's a good sign, right? Isn't it a wonderful day to be alive? It's a little chilly, but the snow is pretty, and we are awake, we are alive, and God has blessed us with another day. If you will look in your bulletin, there are a few little announcements I'll cover. Uh, like there's fellowship lunch today directly after, after the service. Uh, free books. There are books that have been donated, and they're in the bookcase in the room under the stairs. So you can check and see if there's anything of interest or maybe that you'd like to share with somebody else. Uh, we still need pianist and uh, special music. Uh, we're short on our musical talent, so we need others to step up to help praise the Lord. Just putting a bug in your ear. We know there's talent out there. We hope that more will volunteer. Amen. Hilltop Adventist School will be having Spring Vespers on Friday, April 26th at 6.30 p.m. Please mark your calendars and come out and support our school. That's Friday, April 26th at 6.30 p.m. It's titled Forever Changed. It's going to be a good one. And then lastly, unless there's one I don't know about, Pathfinders is having a Mother's Day cinnamon roll fundraiser. So let's help make Mother's Day a bit more sweet. Um, the amount they're being uh, suggested, uh, there's a suggested donation, all that's in the bulletin. Um, but please, please find a Pathfinder and order some cinnamon rolls through them. They're still trying to get to Gillette, the international campery, and they need everybody's help. Even if you don't want the cinnamon rolls, maybe you can throw a donation their way. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started in our morning service. My mouth is not working well this morning. I'm sorry. We'll start with Spirit of the Living God. Awesome. More help is always good. singing our first hymn, number 493, Fill My Cup, Lord. Like a woman at the well, I was seeking
song is number 476, Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. Jesus paid everything for us. Everything. He's promised to give us a light burden and a light yoke. So we need to take the ones off of ourselves and give them to him. And he will make our way so much better. Amen. Amen. Our next song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, number 462. And that is our opening hymn, if you'll please stand with us.
here in this warm sanctuary. The snow fell this morning and it was beautiful but surprising. But we thank you that your warmth is in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And we ask that you would warm us and draw us closer to Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I apologize for the slide mistake there, but that your beautiful singing was lifting to the Lord and I know he loves hearing you sing. I'd like to invite the children forward to receive the Lamb's offering and have a story for you on the front row. Children, make sure you get those dollars in the center of the aisles as well so the people sitting in the middle won't be forgotten. Red mic, is that on? Yes. Testing, one, two, three. Hello, testing, is that coming through? Nope. It is now? Yes. Testing, one, two, three, is it coming through? Yes. All right, good, finally, all right. Well, Good to see all of you up here this morning for a children's story. I'm going to tell you a story about when I was eight years old. Anybody here eight? Yes. No, no almost? How old are you? Ten. Oh. All right. I was eight years old. We were living in Missouri. You know where Missouri is? It's a state in the middle of the country. And um, we lived in Missouri for a couple years there. And something was happening in the sky and we were pretty excited about it and my dad told me we needed to to keep our eyes open but we needed to protect them and i'm going to put a picture on the screen and ask you what these people are doing here on the screen what are they doing swimming no, swimming? no. <laughs> what's on their eyes Goggles or sunglasses, uh-huh. And they're looking up into the where? Sun. What do you think they're looking at? Sun. What are these people doing? 
What's that guy looking through? It's kind of a screen, isn't it? Yeah. What is he looking at? Angels. <laughs> what are those people doing? Looking up at the sun. And we had to look up at the sun that day my dad told me about, but we had to put on these special sunglasses so we could watch the moon pass over the sun, and they called it an eclipse. It would blacken the sun so that the light of the sun wouldn't get down to us. And but we had to wear the sunglasses because the sun peeking through the corner of the eclipse would burn your eyes. Now guess what's coming here in the next few days on April 8. There's going to be an eclipse and the moon is going to pass over the sun and if you are able to, we're not going to see much of it here in, in Idaho. They're going to see it more in the east. But if you can look up at the sun with, as it's passing a little bit, make sure your parents give you special glasses to look at it. You'll see the sun get into a different position, almost about like that first picture over there on the, on the left. It's called an eclipse. And it happens every now and then, and it's pretty exciting when it happens because the, the moon passes in front of the sun and blocks its light. Now, how bright is the sun? Pretty bright. Are you ever to look at the sun with your eyes open? No. no. Never look at the sun directly with your eyes unless you've got good, strong sunglasses because it can burn your eyes out. It's bright. Now, do we need the sun? Yes. Why? It keeps us healthy here, doesn't it? And it makes food grow. Makes food grow, that's right. And the, we need the sun to, to keep the food growing and keep us warm. You know, there are places in the world where the sun hardly ever shines, especially up in, I think, Alaska during the wintertime. And we need the sun to, to keep us healthy and, and doing well. And so on April 8th, which is, I think, Tuesday, there's going to be an eclipse and I want you kids to ask your parents about it. Get only special sunglasses to look up at what the sun is looking like. Well, we don't because the sun does that from our eyes. That's right. That's good. All right. Well, you're, you're a smart kid. All right. But make sure you have those special sunglasses on. We had to get these special glasses that welders use. And they're thick. And we could look through that. Now, my sons, my two sons, or at least one of them, I know, is headed from Michigan down to... Thompsonville, Illinois on Monday and he wants to see that full eclipse down there in Thompsonville because it's going to cover the sun up so much that it will be like it's nighttime. That's pretty exciting in the middle of the day, isn't it? And so you'll be watching for that and uh, those are some of the wonders that we have in the sky. Yes, your hand was up. Well, they're a special sunglasses. I don't know what they're called, but you want to make sure that they're, they're made to look at bright lights with. There's welder's glasses that are good for that because they're nice and thick and, and you won't burn your eyes looking at that. So you ask your mom and dad, okay? Let's have prayer before we go back to your seats. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the see, things we see in the heavens with the sun and the moon and the stars. And we ask that you will help us remember that you are the creator and we can trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can take your baskets back to the lobby. Good morning, church family. Today our, our offering is for church budget. Um, it is through these offerings that help to keep the doors open and the lights on. The local church budget goes for so many things also. Will the deacons please stand as we ask for God's blessing. 
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and the time we could get gathered together to praise you. Thank you for your many blessings, and please be with these offerings. In your name we pray, amen. Our scripture this morning is from Romans 8, 1 to 3. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Thank you. It's time for our prayer song. Um, it's time for us to invite the Holy Spirit to prepare our hearts to speak with the Lord. Please sing with me, Into My Heart. my Jesus, my Jesus. We are here to worship your holy name. What a glorious thing that is for each of us here. We love you, we love you, we love you. And we just need to love you more. That's so true. Sometimes, dear God, the world weighs us down and just seems as though our spiritual side is squashed. But then, I don't know, Lord, it could be through the study of your word, learning more of Jesus himself, and then there will come, like a lightning bolt straight to our hearts, reviving us again. And that's why we have come here. We need reviving in the Holy Spirit's power. We need to stand with Jesus, stand with our God, strong and sure as he stands with us. 
Lord in heaven. There is nowhere else that we can come but to you. You are it. You are everything. And so, Lord, when we hurt, bring us healing. When we want to cry, Lord, cry with us too. May we follow your example every minute of every day. Thank you, Jesus, for the promise of your soon return. Oh, God, how we want you to come back and take us home. We are, Lord Jesus, we are so tired, sick and tired of this world. We want to be, we long, we long to be with you. Lord, we know that you long to be with us probably even more than we do. And so we just say, dear God, we have so many people hurting in our church. Physically they are kind of down and out and discouraged. I know that there are some who don't know which way to turn. And their lives seem to be on the skids right now. Things aren't turning out the way they wished they might. But God, will you please just rise for the moment and give us that only source of hope and peace and joy that we can have in Jesus alone. And we have come here to be built up and strengthened by you, great God. Thank you for doing exactly that. For you have promised that you will never deny us anything that is good for us. So we know that that's about to take place here as our pastor gives to us the word of truth. And may our hearts be enlivened and our hope be even more sure because of the words he brings that you bring through him to us. Thank you, God, for your wonderful, wonderful care. You promised it. You said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so we count on that right here and right now. For those that are sick at heart, for those who are physically ailing and even suffering life-threatening sickness, come to their aid and we count it a privilege even to just simply ask for your blessing and then to know by faith that we have it. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath to everyone. The song I'm going to sing is titled Blessings in Disguise. For the honor and glory of God.
protection while we sleep. We pray for healing, for prosperity. We pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering. And all the while you hear each spoken need. Your love is way too much to give us lesser things. Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes song, Evelyn. Thank you for sharing that with us today. It is beautiful in our eyes. The Son of God can't be eclipsed. Amen? 
He's the Son of Righteousness. The Son, our Savior, our friend, our brother. So grateful for Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, today as we continue in our worship on this Sabbath, we just pray that you will speak to us through your word. And thank you for the encouragement of Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. I'm certain you've heard about it on the news for the last several weeks that there is a big eclipse coming on Monday, April 8th. Weathermen and news broadcasters have been talking about it for weeks. It's an unusual event. When the moon crosses in front of the sun completely, and it becomes like night. April 8, 2024, an eclipse. And some are saying a sign of the second coming. There are those posts on the phones and on your computer that are saying, the end is near. Speaking of this eclipse. Even John Bradshaw from It Is Written had a special broadcast talking about the eclipse and significant and insignificant things about this coming event. All kinds of televangelists are speaking about it. In fact, there's more people speaking about the return of Jesus than I've heard in a very long time. People holding their cell phones in their hands. There are predictions about this eclipse on their screens and they can pull them up and look at them. This comes from Amazing Discoveries Ministry in Canada, an Adventist uh, sub-ministry uh, uh, separate from the church but definitely in, indicative that they believe in the second coming and, and they believe in the Adventist message. Yes, on April 8th, the sun will be totally eclipsed in certain parts of the country, not the whole country. And it's going to start near Mexico, in Mexico, and swipe north and cross the line where there was an eclipse in 2017, and it will match itself near Nashville, Tennessee. People are excited. People are gathering their glasses, their goggles, to look up and see it become night over certain locations. Like I said, my son Michael's traveling down to Thompsonville, Illinois, near Three Angels Broadcasting Network, where it will be fully eclipsed. He's going to drive down there five and a half hours one way, take a look at it for a few minutes, and then come back five and a half hours the other way, making his mother and I very nervous. <laughs> He didn't want to go on the bus from Andrews. He said, he just wanted to be more independent. So pray for our son Michael as he drives down to Thompsonville. The sun will be eclipsed. But I want to tell you this as we begin the message this morning. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, can never be eclipsed. Do you believe that? He's a beautiful Son of Righteousness. Our hope for the future and yes, indeed, as the Bible says and as the Christian world is rehearsing, Jesus is coming very, very soon. Now on this broadcast, and I've watched all three parts about the April 8 eclipse, they're comparing it to Nineveh, in Nashville, and I'll share with you in a moment why they're comparing it to, to Nineveh and Nashville. Uh, Nineveh was a city at the time of Jonah, the prophet, and God told Jonah to go down to Nineveh and to proclaim to them that if they didn't repent, that in 40 days, Nineveh would be completely destroyed. And Jonah, and he went down there reluctantly, as you know the story, he got went a side trip and got caught up in a whale and all the rest of it got spit up and his hair was bleached and his skin was bleached by that whale's toxic 
uh, chemicals in his stomach. Finally, he went down to Nineveh and he preached, thinking no one is going to accept a, a message from a Jewish prophet that God is going to destroy their city for their wickedness. But to his surprise and to the Lord's delight, they all repented. Is that good news? Jonah went and pouted on the beach for a while. Lord, why didn't you destroy them? I knew this is what you'd do. If they came back to you, even if they didn't mean it, I knew you'd hold back. Now I'm embarrassed. We shouldn't be, preachers shouldn't be embarrassed if the people are converted, should they? Now Nashville, where supposedly this eclipse is going to cross from the last eclipse in 2017, there are some in independent ministries that are saying this is a significant event. Because in Nashville, there's a particular monument that was built in the 1890s, and we'll read about it here in a moment, but I'll show you a picture of it. I visited there several years ago to this replica of the Parthenon in Athens, a temple to the goddess Athena. It's a big, huge temple. It's about the size as the one in Greece. I went in there, I paid my whatever amount was, and I went and looked inside, and I'll show you in a minute what it looked like inside. But here's what it looked like in the 1890s when there was this international event there in Nashville. And you can see there with all the different buildings around there, they were all very Romanesque looking. There's even a pyramid of the Egyptians behind the Parthenon. And it was quite a, a place for the, for the country to go and, and to celebrate um, the centennial of the state of Tennessee. Here's another picture of it from, that an artist drew of the times. Now, the only building in that park now is that Parthenon. The rest of those buildings were torn down in time. They were not solidly as built as the Parthenon replica. Now here's the inside of this um, replica of the Parthenon there in um, Nashville. I took this picture from my phone and you can see how big this tall image of the goddess Athena is. She raises way up high towards the ceiling and looks down on everybody. And as I took a look at her and I took a picture of her shield that she holds there by her waist. You can see something on that shield. What is it? It's a snake or a serpent. Who is behind all pagan gods and goddesses? Satan is. And this face evidently by the sculpture that sculptured this Athena's looking image, this is the face of the artist himself, himself, he made himself what he thought would look like Athena. And here's the Parthenon at night. Now, there is, in writing, and I'll read it here for you in a moment, a vision that a little lady had about Nashville. She had these visions in about 1890 at the time of this World's Fair event. And in her vision, she said she saw a ball of fire coming and descending on large buildings that had pillars. And the fire came down and burned up the buildings that she could see in her vision. Let me read to you now what was written in 1889-90, somewhere in there, what Ellen White saw in vision. There was a scene presented to me, she says. It was the night before the Sabbath. That is when that scene was presented. So in other words, it was Friday night. I looked out of the windows, and there was an immense ball of fire that had come down from heaven and it fell where they were casting buildings 
with what? Pillars were presented to me. And it seemed as if the ball came right to the building and crushed it. And they saw that it was branching out, branching out, enlarging, and they began to cry and mourn and mourn and wring their hands. And I thought some of our people stood there well, saying, well, it's just as we have been ex expecting. It's just as we have been expecting it. And just what we have been talking about. You knew it, said the people. You knew it and you never told us about it. I thought there was such an agony in their faces, such an agony in their appearance. Manuscript 152, 1904. Now, speaking of this vision that she saw, she saw another one in 1905. When I was at Nashville, I had been speaking to the people, and in the night season, there was an immense ball of fire that came from heaven and settled where? In Nashville. There were flames going out like arrows from the ball. Houses being consumed. Houses were tottering and falling. Some of our people were standing there. It is just as we expected, they said. We expected this. Others were wringing their hands in agony and crying to the God, God for mercy. You knew it, they said. You knew this was coming and never a word was war to warn us. They seemed as though they would almost tear them to pieces to think that they had never been told them or given them any warning at all. Manuscript 188, 1905. Now why, many are asking, was Ellen White given this vision about Nashville being destroyed by balls of fire and large pillared buildings being destroyed. And the people screaming out, you knew this was coming, yet you never told us. Wringing their hands, wringing their eyes with fear. Some are wondering, some are asking if this eclipse that came in 2017 and now followed by this one in 2024 that crosses near the same region is a warning sign from heaven. Now this is what some are bringing forward. Eclipses have been in the past in biblical times used as warning signs of imminent danger. Now, some of the rich and wealthy in our country have been in recent years building bunkers. Now these are not just basements. These are elaborate underground mansions where the millionaires are putting their luxury items, their furnishings, their hot tubs, their food in these bunkers to prepare from some, for some kind of disaster. I watched a video on this and I clipped some of the clips and I'll show those to you. Luxury bunkers and divine assurances said at the beginning of this video. Another gentleman as he's walking unreveal, revealing luxury bunkers far beyond basic survival needs. A pursuit of safety has led to a boom designed not just for survival, but for maintaining a standard of living the most, that most can hardly dream of. These modern day parks, or arcs as they said, are protection for the wealthy, for what they believe may be coming upon the earth. Here's one of these bunkers this, in all places, is in New Zealand. And you can see how large it is up against those mountains. And it reminds me of a passage in Revelation chapter 6, 
verses 15 through 17, and the video spoke in reference to this passage, and I read it now to you off the screen. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? And they say to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide us. We've read that already. And they were running, running to hide themselves from the face of the Lamb. We've seen in the past two years panic over toilet paper and food items. And we know how quickly grocery stores can empty when people panic and store up needs for themselves from whatever is coming in some kind of disaster. Ellen White also wrote in the devotional book that was edited by the Ellen White, um, the Ellen White, um, uh, what's that office called? The Estate. In the book Maranatha, she writes these very interesting words. The Lord has shown me in vision repeatedly that it is contrary to the Bible to make any provision for our temporal wants in the time of trouble. I saw that if the saints have food laid up by them in the fields or in the fields, in the time of trouble when sword, famine, and pestilence are in the land, it will be taken from them by violent hands and strangers would reap their fields. Then will be the time for us to trust wholly in God and, we will, and he will sustain us. I saw that our bread and water would be sure at that time, and we should not lack or suffer hunger. The Lord has shown me that some of his children would fear when they see the, peer, the, the price of food rising, and they would buy food and lay it up for them in the time of trouble. Then in the time of need, I saw them go to their food and look at it, and it was bread, it had bread worms, it was full of living creatures and not fit for use. Interesting words of counsel from a lady that I believe was given to the Adventist church in a prophetic way. You'll see online these repeated reports about the end is near, storing up food, preparing for yourself, preparing for your family, and get ready because the time of tribulation is coming when the Antichrist will show himself. Now this, I want to say to you, is not biblical teaching. There is not an Antichrist coming in the future. Some mysterious European from an Eastern European nation. Notice what John the prophet writes concerning the Antichrist. In fact, in his epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he writes about the Antichrist in four locations, and this is the only time the word is used in the scripture about the Antichrist. Now, I'm doing a little bit of educating and teaching here because we have to be careful not to be caught off guard by false prophetic um, proclamations. We're going to look for an example at... 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. 
in John's lifetime, when he died around 90 AD, he said there were already Antichrist powers rising in the world. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Thessalonians in chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together in him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of the Lord had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. The falling away of what? The falling away in the church. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. By the way, there's only one other person in the Bible called the son of perdition, and that was Judas, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or, is worship, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he, what? Is God. Paul predicted that the Lord would not come until the Antichrist, or the son of perdition, would be revealed, the man of sin. And indeed, it was in the Middle Ages when we began to see the fulfillment of who this man of sin, who this Antichrist represented. I'm going to show you several pictures here to demonstrate some of the pompous statements that Paul mentions here in his epistle to the Thessalonians. Before I do that, though, I want to go to Daniel chapter 7, because in Daniel chapter 7, I'm only giving you small amounts of, of, of information this morning because we don't have time. But if you look at Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8, he says, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up from among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by their roots. And there in, the, and there in the, this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous or blasphemous words. Verse 11, I watched then, because the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking, I watched till the beast was slain, and the body destroyed and given up to burning flames. This power of a little horn, of an antichrist, of a pompous man, a little horn, has been around for a long time in history. This is not some future person who's coming yet for a seven-year tribulation. Here I have a picture of Pope Pius XXI sitting on his pompous throne and wearing a tiara, a crown, indicating that he, in his papal office, is the vicar of the Son of God. Here's a picture of the same pope being carried in his sedan chair with red butlers, carrying him above the crowd. Almost reminds you of a pharaoh, doesn't it? The Protestant reformers of the 15 and 1600s all came to the same conviction in studying Daniel and Revelation and Paul's writings in Thessalonians and other scriptures. They all came to the same conclusion, the same conviction. I'll read this for you. A great cloud of witnesses. Wycliffe, Tyndale, Luther, Calvin, Cramner, in the 17th century, Bunyan and translators of the King James Bible and the men who published the Westminster and Baptist Confections of Faith, Sir Isaac Newton, Wesley, Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, had more recently, and more recently Spurgeon, Bishop C. Ryle, and doc, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. These men, among countless others, all saw the office of the papacy as the Antichrist. It already, they 
would see in their times that this power existed in their lifetime and on into the future. Here's a picture of Pope John the 23rd sitting on his papal throne with his tiara on. By the way, I saw his body in St. Peter's Basilica nearly 20 years ago when I went on a great controversy tour there. And Pope John the 23rd was laying in a glass coffin. He looked perfectly preserved. They said it was a miracle. And they were, of course, later he became a saint of the church. And I was there taking pictures of him. The man says, do you want to pray with him? I said, I don't want to pray with him. I just want to take his picture. Here's another picture of Pope Paul VI on a sedan chair being carried through the crowds. Here's Pope John Paul the I. John Paul II didn't, wasn't carried in a sedan chair, but he sat on a throne. The pompous acts of the, here's Pope Benedict the 15th, or the 16th, I can't remember now. Sitting on a throne, and notice what's on either side of him. Two angels. And here's Pope Francis sitting on that same throne with two angels, sitting, as Paul said, as it were, on God's throne. Friends, you cannot eclipse the Son of God. He cannot be eclipsed. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he is coming soon in glory. Notice this passage from Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him. Who's him? Jesus. Exalted him the name which is above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and on earth and those under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to God, to the glory of God the Father. He is the only one that is the Son of righteousness that cannot be eclipsed However, when Jesus hung on the cross, Satan was trying to eclipse the Son of God and murder him. And God in his own power darkened the sky so that they could not look and boast in such glory. And on that first day of the week, as we talked about last week, Jesus sat up in that tomb, sat up, heard the voice of the angel saying, your father calls you. And he sat up and he looked and he breathed with a sigh of relief. We did it, we did it. And when he came out, there was victory there at that garden tomb when Jesus stood and faced the devil himself and reminded him, you cannot eclipse me. Friends, I believe that we are living near the return of Jesus. Do not let our homes and our wealth eclipse our relationship with our Savior. Even if we are righteous church members, don't puff yourselves up with your goodness or your, your righteousness. We only find righteousness and goodness in the Son of God. Don't eclipse the Son of God. Now some believe that on this eclipse day, April 8th, that there will be 40 days before fire comes down on certain cities. Some believe it may be the next day. I don't know. The Bible is not clear on this. But I would say to all of us here, don't fear what might happen on April 8 or following. Be ready in Christ Jesus and don't let him be eclipsed from your life or my life. If we have the sun of righteousness shining in our forefront of our lobe, in our heart, if he has sealed us, there is nothing to fear. And there's a lot of fear mongering going on on the internet right now. We want our God to be at the center of our lives. We want him to be nearer to us than ever before. Do you believe that? And so in this 
closing part of the message, I just say with you, and I ask you to read the screen with me, don't eclipse the Son of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Son of Righteousness, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is coming soon. We don't know exactly when, but we can see that it is on the horizon. The signs are indicating that he's coming. Whether this eclipse is another warning, we don't know. But if we are in Christ, if he is not eclipsed from our hearts, then it won't matter what's coming as long as we're sealed in Jesus. I mean, we do that every day by prayer and petition and seeking you and seeking your will. And we thank you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. And all God's people said together, Amen. Draw nearer, my God, to thee. We need Jesus in our hearts and in our lives like never before. Let's sing this hymn together as our song leaders lead it with us this time. Please stand and join us in singing Nearer My God to Thee, number 473 in your hymnals. Yeah. yeah.
Father in heaven, please be near us. Please, may we embrace you and you embrace us. May we embrace the truths of the Bible. And that no matter what lays ahead in the days before us, that we'll not have fear, we'll not give up on you, because you've not given up on us. We want to trust you, stay close to you, as always, until Jesus finally returns, because he is coming. May those in the world that are looking for answers find them in you. May we be witnesses to them in our daily lives and in our, in, in our interaction with other people. Guide us and teach us, now we ask, in and through the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Behind you here. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me.